chapter 15 in the shadow of Arad. Living underwater at such great depths, the senses are unable to determine if it is night or day. The body must rely on its own internal clock to determine when to sleep and when to wake. In this particular case, the crew had undergone such intense training together, their internal clocks were closely aligned. The first morning together, all the crew members awoke within an hour of each other. Since all sleeping chambers were in the back of the shuttle, close to the dining area, one by one they trickled in to share a meal before starting on the day's agenda. The thought of another exciting day overwhelmed their minds. David and Vanita's thoughts raced between the excitement of falling in love and the adventure of the mission. Jean-Pierre, on the other hand, was more concerned with the events of the previous day. He was disappointed that he did not respond quicker to the threat presented by the menacing sea creatures. He was adamant about replaying the event in his mind until he could pinpoint exactly where he should improve. This way, he would be more successful in countering the future threats or potential hazards that would inevitably arise. The arms guards had hoped for an exciting journey, but yesterday's events were more than they were prepared to handle. They secretly wished today would be a quiet day to ponder the beautiful marine life visible from the vessel. Admiral McDougall was well aware that the safety of the vessel and everyone aboard was in her hands. She understood how closely they all came to having that safety compromised when the twin squintopuses attacked them yesterday. She promised herself that no matter what the challenge, she would never come to that close annihilation again. The security of this mission and our return home rest on my shoulders, she assured herself with a whisper. The first door to slide open was Professor Jackson's. She walked down the corridor towards the dining room. On her way, she stopped in front of Dr. Downey's room. She placed the outstretched fingers of one hand on his door while the other rested against her beating heart. She visualized him on the other side of the door like she did the night before. Vanita was so engrossed in reliving the moment of the previous evening, she didn't feel the door open. David saw her standing there with her eyes closed and one palm resting open on the door. He was pleased to see her, feeling exactly as she felt. He placed his face into her open hand and kissed her thumb as it rested softly against his lips. When she recognized the sensation of his lips puckering gently against her skin, her heart leapt, her stomach tightened, and her eyes opened. Venita wasn't so much startled as she was slightly embarrassed to have been caught daydreaming like a schoolgirl. His reassuring smile steadied her nerves and she wrapped both arms around his neck and drew him close. He tightened his grip around her waist before letting her go. They were beaming as they walked towards the dining hall for breakfast. The arms guards, Jean-Pierre Vol and Admiral McDougall all seemed to exit their suites at the same time, precisely the same time to view the embrace between David and Vanita and walk behind them as they floated to the dining hall. When the large sliding glass doors to the mess hall slid open, none of them had enough nerve to enter. As the earliest risers, they were the first group to be at breakfast that day. They stood frozen with uncertainty as they stared into the kitchen. They had encountered strange things on this journey, but certainly nothing could have entered the vessel without their knowledge. How could there be plates and cups all over the counter, started Dr. Downey. Why are crumbs of food on the floors and in the sink? How could the tables and chairs look as if an army had just used them? Followed Jean-Pierre. They felt faint. Their heads were spinning in confusion as they tried to make sense of the sight before them. Mary, as the highest in command, took the lead and passed through the doorway into the kitchen. She walked to the middle of the hall floor to inspect the incident from a different angle. The crew stared at her, hoping to absorb her fearlessness. Has anyone been here before? Admiral McDougall asked, but nobody answered. 
Okay guys, this is our first time in the dining hall together. Maybe the captain and his crew who were training us ate before we embarked and just left this mess, she naively suggested. Her hypothesis defied logic. Throughout the dizzying side-by-side -side maneuvering, speeding and stopping of the day before, there would have been shattered plates and cups on the ground. It was evident nothing was crushed or broken, but the dishes had definitely been used and not put away. Come on, guys, Helena Omsgard said. She tugged her husband's hand, pulling him into the mess hall behind Mary. The others followed their lead. They searched around the cafeteria for any sign of what could have caused this disturbance, but they found none. Lars Omgard said, Maybe you're right, Admiral. Maybe it was the captain and his crew who left this mess behind. Yes, what else could have happened? Mary convinced herself to believe the only possible conclusion. However, Mary knew the captain and his crew very well. She knew that he was an extremely disciplined and well-organized man. He would have never left the room in such disarray. He never would have tolerated his men to do so either. What else could have happened? She asks herself quietly. Mary changes subject. Before we all went to sleep, Jean-Pierre and I parked a shuttle some distance away from a wide, bright, shining object. We can get out into the open waters and investigate it. I'll carry the remote with me so that, so that we can re-enter the ship after our investigation. Give us a chance to eat and clean the place first, Admiral. After that, we're all yours, said Vanita. They ate a hearty meal, preparing them for the long day ahead. After breakfast, Vanita and Helena began cleaning up the kitchen. David gave Vanita a hand. Everyone else joined in to speed up the task. After Lars swept up the last bits of dirt from the floor, the crew exited the cafeteria to go to the cockpit. The adventurers rushed along the broad hallway, ready to investigate what awaited them. Suddenly, the crew's steps slowed. As they neared the cockpit, light glimmered through the hallway. The panels on the walls near the control center had been removed, allowing the light from the ocean to shine brilliantly through the clear glass. They took tiny steps to approach the first missing panel. Jean-Pierre looked through the clear glass and saw nothing except a wide open space, wide enough to carry an army. He tiptoed further into the open area of the control center. The others cautiously followed him, their hearts pounding. They were ready to deal with never-before-seen creatures, even the people living in the seas outside of their shuttle. But they were not prepared to deal with anything inside of their own safe haven. If something could enter the vessel without their knowledge, they were no longer safe in this environment. Mary and her crew looked around with some confusion. They never knew that this space existed in the aqua station. Be prepared to meet whomever or whatever did this, Mary warned. Maybe the panels all came unhinged when we were sleeping, hoped Vanita. Yes, we did a lot of twisting and turning in our journey, continued Helena. No, it isn't just the panels. It is also the space behind the panels. After years of training, not one of us knew this room existed, countered Mary. Let's go to the control room and gather our thoughts. Try to piece together what's going on, she continued. The Admiral looked down the corridor at the final left turn in the hall, leading to the cockpit. The crew wondered what could be waiting for them just beyond that curve. Let's stay together, commanded Admiral McDougall. Dr. Downey put his arm around Professor Jackson's shoulder. She wrapped her arm around his waist. In this uncertainty, it was best for the pioneers to draw closer together. Every step towards the control center heightened their sense of fear. When they made the dreaded final left turn, their mouths dropped. They tried to cry out, but remained silent. Standing at attention, guarding the entrance to the control room were uniformed soldiers. The soldiers were heavily armed. The military guardsmen gazed menacingly at them. Mary noticed the on their uniform. United States, 
who was abbreviated on the shoulder pad of the guards. She bravely walked past them and into the open cockpit. I am Admiral Mary McDougall of the United Nations Exploration Team, she explained. Yeah, we know who you are, Admiral. You and your ragtag team, come on in, ordered a big burly man. He stood with the commander's stance in the same spot that belonged to Mary during their travel. His large uniform boasted an impressive amount of medals and honors. Thank us for being so patient in those tight quarters while you almost destroyed this vessel with your poor maneuvering skills. Not to mention your inept decision making on this trip. He slowly turned so that she could clearly read his name above his medals. Van Deer. Mary squint her eyes to make out the small lettering on his jacket. Jack Van Deer, she shockingly confirmed. In the flesh, sarcastically responded Van Deer. His reputation preceded him in many military circles. Mary had heard of Commander Van Deer, but had never personally met him. She knew he was both hated and respected, but most of all, feared. Which emotion would he inspire in her, she quietly wondered to herself in an attempt to regain her composure. We didn't want to wake up you sleeping beauties this morning, so we helped ourselves. More importantly, we did your job for you, Admiral, he said disrespectfully. Walk yourself over here and take a look at these monitors, he commanded. Mary cautiously stepped around his army of warriors, who had now taken control of the center. When she reached him, he barked at her. Look into these monitors. You see that bright light down the way, approximately two miles from here? That is the vessel we were sent to confiscate. 